You're like Max MacGyver. Uh, but thank you. I like MacGyver. Uh, so we're going to graph this function. And I'll, I'll try and reiterate this as, as much as possible because this statement that I'm about to make is really significant like for the rest of all the math that you'll do. This is a function, and a function's all about input and output. If I put something in for x, I'll get something out for f of x or y. Uh, and if I can grasp that, then I've got like half of it, I would say at least 50% of the ideas that we're trying to communicate here are just that you have a function, and there's something you put in, and there's something you get out. And if you get enough of those input-output pairs, well, we can put them on the, the, uh, the coordinate plane as points, and if we get enough of those points, we start to see what this graph should be shaped like. And it's only graphing, after graphing a few exponential growth and exponential decay functions, we start to see patterns like, oh, well, all exponential growth functions will look like this. Right? They'll, they'll all be almost flat on the left, and then, uh, well, then all I need to know is kind of, where does this curve happen? And then I can say for, to the left, it'll be kind of flat, and to the right, it'll go up. Right? And so that's why we only get a few points. If I had no idea what this graph looked like, I would need to get lots of points. I'd need to get this point, this point, this point, all these points. And then I would start to see what that graph should look like. And that's what we did when we started graphing these early on. We, we uh, established what the general shape should be, and then how to find some key points. So in reality, we should never really have to memorize formulas other than the quadratic formula for this kind of thing, because we can just plug stuff in and get stuff out. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not, there's not really formulas that are associated with this, but like shifting up and down. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we don't really, really need that. Yeah. We kind of need to know what the graph looks like. We want to save ourselves a little time. But and you can get by without even knowing that. Yeah. The only thing is, like, if I if I were to graph some points, plus some points of an exponential function, and I got these ones, I might think the graph goes like this. But I'd have to plot a few more points and realize, like, oh, it's starting to flatten out. So it should look like that. Right. Plus, it's not really logical for it to curve and then suddenly go off into these bits in the straight line. So, so, I mean, you gotta, you gotta think about it. You gotta think of it in terms of a function. And if you do, then yeah, you don't really need to memorize. It shifts this much and goes left and goes right and stretches and gets slower and stuff. That's a fun word. Stretches. Stretches. Yes, that's fun. Well, okay. So it, it, it's this function. It's got input. It's got output. And I want to graph these input output pairs as um, fairly simple proposition. So I'm going to plug something in for one. And if I had no idea what is a convenient thing to plug in for x, I just plug in anything. And, and that's okay. You can plug anything in there. Let's plug in one and see what happens. Four to the one plus three. And we'll add one. What happens? Here we have four to the four. Now, four to the fourth, what's that? 256. It's very, very big. And then we add 1 to 256, we get 257. That's even worse. Those are negatives. Huh? Those are negatives. So maybe some negatives for x would be better than 1. Yeah. So, but, uh, but we did the work, so we might as well write down. When we plugged in 1, we got out 257. And now I'm starting to understand this function. Oh, you know, it doesn't take that big an exponent to get a very big output. Okay? This is a real output. We could put it on the graph, but. Gosh, going up to 257, that's more, that's bigger than I really want to deal with. Okay. So instead of that, maybe some smaller numbers would be easier to work with. Negative one. Like negative one. Okay, let's try negative one. Four to the negative one plus three. One, that's four to the second power. That's better. Four squared is just 16. We add one, we get. 70. It's much better than 257. That's, That's still not ideal. But maybe not. Yeah, 17 still kind of big. So if we, if we don't want 17, if 17 is too big, what can we do smaller. to get the smaller number out? 2. Negative 2. Let's do negative 2. Plus negative 2 equals 4 to the negative 2 plus 3 equals 
4 to the 1. That's 1 here. 4 to the 1 plus 1, that's just 5. That's nice. Much nicer. Negative 3. Negative 2 comma 5. When we put in negative 2, we only had to do 4 to the 1. We had 1, we just get 5. So let's try negative 3. 4 to the negative 3 plus 3 plus 1. That's 4 to the 0. What's 4 to the 0? 1, that's 1 plus 1, that's only 2. Can you go up one more two and put the negative 4, please? Sure, we'll do negative 4. Yeah, put negative 4, let's see what happens there. 4 to the negative 4 plus 3. That's 4 to the negative 1. Now what's 4 to the negative 1? 1, you mean 4? 1 fourth. 1 over 4. Plus 1, 1 and a fourth. 1 and a fourth. Or 5 fourths. When we put in negative 4, we got out 1 and a 4, so 5 fourths. Because the plus 1 shifted it up 1. Yep. But that information is superfluous. Yeah. And sometimes um, I'll have students um, do great work and plug in the next value and then figure out what the y value should be, do it correctly. And then they say, like, oh, but the plus one shifts it up one, and then still try and shift it up one. But if you found the y value, like, that's it. That, that is what the graph is. You plot the x versus the y, and there you go. You don't need to shift it up one then. Like, that, that shifting up one is kind of trying to be a shortcut to find the actual y value. But if you went through the trouble and the work to find the y value, there's no point in doing that shift up one. Shift up with one is assuming that we know we're starting with four to the x, which looks like that. I'm going to take this guy, you're going to move it to the right three, or to the left three, and up one. So it looks something like that. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you just plug in x's and find y's, plot those points, which are after those points. That's all it takes. All right, so we've got some points. Uh, we, we don't probably want to graph that one. We've got three here. You probably don't even want to bother with 17. That's a little too big. So let's see. Uh, negative 2 comma 5. 5. Uh, negative 3, 2. Go negative 2. Or sorry, negative 4. And 1 and a 4. So there's 1 and a 4th. This is barely above 1. That's where your plus one can come in handy. If we're familiar with exponential functions, graphs of, expo or graphs of exponential, exponential functions, uh, then we know that one side kind of goes up and, and gets close to being horizontal, and the other side goes up and up and up. So I should know that this, this place where it gets horizontal is up one from normal, it's up here. And you don't have to put that dotted line, but you need to show that you realize it's going to get closer and closer and closer to 1, but never quite get to 1. And then it's going to shoot way up here. And by the time we get to negative 1, should, the should y value should be 17. Uh, if we were to get over to 1, then the y value would be 257. And that's how steep this thing needs to be to be able to make it to those y values. So, so the farther to the right you go, the steeper, kind of steeper it gets as it appears. Yeah, it's a steepness increases as you go. Steepness. 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 That's steep. That's a word. It is a word, actually. Uh, technically speaking, this graph is concave up because of that. That's a calculus -y word. It's concave up because it's steepness keeps getting bigger. From, from the left to the right, the steepness is always getting bigger. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and then a lot bigger as you get to that point. So that curve is when it goes up the fastest. It increases, oh, you want it increases the most? Oh, that's a good question. Really good question. Mm. By like the most steep. Or goes from being almost um, 
almost flat, so like almost zero degrees to being almost straight up and down to almost, so almost 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Like, and that like sense. two clicks. That's a good question. One we can't really answer today, or ever in algebra two, but it's a good question. Can we answer it in calculus? No, but we could. That's a calculus question. So that, that approach is kind of like, well, I don't, Kind of assuming I don't, I don't really know what this graph is supposed to look like, so I'm just going to plug in some numbers and see what comes out, and plot those points, and uh, and connect them with a smooth curve. But if I do know something about exponential functions, then I know that it would be easy to figure out four to the first is, what four to the zero is, and what four to the negative one is. I like these exponents in exponential functions. I like to raise things to the first. Because that's just the number that you're raising to the first. I like raising things to the zero because that's always one. I like to raise something to the negative one because that's just the reciprocal. One fourth. And that works for five, seven, three, whatever. It always works. So we use that information and say, well, what I would like to have up there is a negative one, zero. Anything could go there. I could put in two, I could put in three, I could put in four, but if I put in numbers that are too big, I get something big like 257. It's very large. If I uh, have something that's like really negative, let's look at four to the negative three, for instance. Well, four to the negative three is the same as one fourth to the third. And what's one fourth to the third going to be? What's 16 times four? It's going to be 1 fourth times 1 fourth times 1 fourth, which is going to be 1 over 64. So this fraction is so small, it would be really challenging to try and graph 1 64th or 1 and 1 64th. It's so minute that to try and graph it with any accuracy is just kind of silly. One fourth, four, one, these these points are not too hard to plot. So my exponent, this is my exponent, my exponent is negative one, then I get one. My exponent is zero, I get one. My exponent is one, I get four. The thing we have to kind of go back and figure out is what would x have to be? What are the point in for x? to get this negative one, right? So here's what we're looking at, four to the x plus three. What is it that I need to put right there so that I come up with four to the negative one? Negative four. Yeah. Negative four, so this has to be negative four. Right? That needs to be negative four, so that this is negative one, so that I get four to the negative one. And if I want it to come out to zero, negative three. Three for that to happen. And how about to get what? Negative two. Two. Then after we raise four to that exponent, we're going to add one to that number. So one fourth plus one. One and fourth. One plus one. Two. Four plus one. Minus five. So we we found the exact same outputs. Not really that different a method. Um, but if we write it down this way, it kind of explains why we have a shift to the left three. Because those x values need to be three less. So when I add three to them, I get the, the negative one, zero, one exponents that I like. Any questions about that? Anything about this confuse you? Or does anything about this make it more clear? Is that helpful? No. Just doing that with one problem over there with me and that. Uh, and uh, it's a lot better. Tyler understands. Somebody asked a question right before class started, which was great. Uh, 
and you can even ask questions after class has started. So. Okay. Nothing? You ready to move on? Okay. <laughs>